Good morning. Good morning. For those of you who have announcements, please come up. Yeah, there you go. That's right. Excellent. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, the Community Cafe this um, month is on May 20th, so hopefully all of you can come. I believe it's um, hot dogs and fixings, and there is a sign-up sheet downstairs for salads. Um, we've got people sign up for um, brownies and a few other things that that team asked for, but we do need salads, so if somebody could help with that, that would be great. Do we have any other announcements? All right, then let us join our hearts and minds together in a spirit of worship. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to St. Luke's United Methodist Church in, well, now apparently sunny downtown Derry, New Hampshire. <laughs> is good. Clouds are moving out, and we'll get a little bit of a break from some of the rain, which is nice, but yeah, we can still use, use a little more of that. So I was, uh, as I was leaving this morning, it was kind of interesting, a great reminder of springtime. I open up the garage door, and there, outside my garage, of course, is my azalea bushes, and uh, right there in front of the house with the beautiful pink flowers, and just looking absolutely gorgeous. And I noticed that this piece of, uh, looked like rib, white ribbon or painter's tape, probably, was stuck there in my bush, just kind of sticking out, and I'm like, oh, great. They've been doing some construction work, cleaning up the house next door putting up new siding, and I'm like, yeah, the wind got it, and they're polluting my yard and throwing their trash all over it. Great, that's all I need, right? So I go over there, and I'm going to take this piece of tape out of my bush, and just before I'm ready to pull on this, I look inside the bush to where the tape is going, and I see a nest inside the bush, and sitting on the nest was this robin. And she's staring at me like, who are you, Lewis? <laughs> and it's her tape. She's got that tape is woven right into the nest. And there's no way I'm going to get this tape out without destroying or damaging the nest somehow. So I'm like, OK, I am stuck with this piece of tape in my azalea <laughs> until the hatching is done, which is about three weeks from now, as I recall. 
So, but it was a great reminder that it is spring, that spring has finally arrived, mud season for you local folks. And uh, it is a very beautiful time of year, despite the fact that my wife and son are highly allergic. No, but that's all right. I just plug my ears. I don't have to listen to that all day long. No. But it's great to see you all here today. Uh, but now let us uh, open our worship with a word of prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, Lord of the earth, Lord of the springtime, Lord of all the seasons, we thank you for the beauty that you're revealing to us now. We thank you for this time of gathering in your name so that we may praise and worship you. Open our hearts and our minds to the lessons that you would have us learn today. Open us to be more receptive to one another and to people with different points of view. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. <coughs> for the call to worship. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with his own mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. Our opening hymn is To God Be the Glory in the Red Hymnal, number 98.
join me in today's opening prayer? O wisdom on high, by you the meek are guided in judgment, and light rises up in darkness for the godly. Grant us in all doubts and uncertainties the grace to ask that you would have us do, that may be saved from all false choices, and that in your light we may see light, and in your straight path may not stumble. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. children want to come up? No. <laughs> no? Okay. Good. So, at Pleasant Street, when I was talking to the children there, trying to give my message, one of the more active ones there decided that uh, while I was talking, it was a good time to start a conga line. <laughs> and I got the kids going. <laughs> Go figure. All right. Only got one kid today, so no conga line, right? Yeah. <laughs> so Gracie, let me get down here. It doesn't matter. Ugh. So my problems are being tall. You know, it's hard to see you from up there. <laughs> you ever have a, a time when your mom or dad told you you didn't know about something? Yeah. And but it was something you really, really wanted. Yeah. And you got upset, angry about it, yeah. <coughs> and you just, you, you felt so angry, you just wanted to like pound something, or you, yeah, you know, you know how that is. <laughs> well, I know how it is too, because I get that way, you know. I'm a grown up, and I still get that way. People tell me no about something that I really, really, really want, and then I just kind of like, that's all I can do to control myself sometimes, so. It takes a lot of practice to learn how to control yourself that way. It does. So, sometimes, you know, when God tells us no, even when we're grown-ups, we get the same way. You know, God might say, sorry, but you can't have this, at least not now. Or, or God has something else in mind, and we don't like what God tells us. We don't like what our parents tell us for the same reason, right? Yeah. And so we get angry, we get upset, and sometimes we do some foolish things because we're angry and upset. You know, we might break something that we don't really want to break. Uh, we don't even think about it. We just do this thing, and even though we know it's wrong, we don't care. You know, so. And that happens sometimes. And, but it's important to stop and think a moment when these times happen. And I'm sure you're, you, you know this as well as I do, I think, that you need to stop and think about these moments when they happen because sometimes there's a good reason when we're told no. Like maybe this toy that we want, it's a little too old for us and it might not be safe. Or maybe there isn't enough money to afford it. Or maybe there's something better coming along. Like maybe what we want is being reserved for a birthday or Christmas present. But for a number of reasons, we're not told these things. Right? Yeah. I, we don't want to spoil the surprise. Or maybe our parents don't think we would understand if it was explained to us, even though we know we would. Right? Yeah. So, and sometimes it gets that way with God, too. We don't understand why God tells us no. 
Maybe God's holding out for something better. Maybe God has seen something dangerous that we didn't see. Maybe God is like saying, yes, I know now, but holding out for later when the time is better, when we better have better understanding of things or maybe when we're a bit bigger. Hmm? Yeah. So, so when we come across this, the next time your parents or your teacher or maybe even God says no, what are we going to do? We're going to think. That's right. We are going to think. And we're going to say, all right, they said no. There's got to be a reason why they said no. Maybe we can ask what that reason is, and they'll tell us. Okay? We may not like the explanation either, but at least we'll have a reason. Yeah. Because when we start understanding how another person thinks, it becomes easier not to get angry, and it becomes easier to be forgiving. Mm -hmm. So let's say a prayer. Okay. Lord Jesus, we don't always understand why you and your Father do what it is you do. We don't always understand when you tell us no for something that we really, really want. Just as we don't understand when our earthly parents tell us no for things that we really, really want. But Lord, give us patience. Help us to think before we act, before we become angry and upset. Help us to remember to ask so that we can understand. Because these times when we would want to be upset, maybe times when we can come to understand each other better. In your name, Lord Jesus, we ask this. Amen.
Our first scripture reading today is from Acts uh, uh, chapter 1, 12 through 26. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olive, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot and Judas son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women including Mary the mother of Jesus as well as his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, together the crowd numbered about 120 persons, and said, friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their language, Hakel Dama, that is field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead become desolate and let there be no one to live in it. And let another take the position of overseer. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and are, are among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed to Joseph called Barbarus, who is also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these to you, which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in the ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Please stand for the gospel reading. Matthew 27, uh, 1 through 10. When morning came, all the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is this to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest taking the pieces of silver said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since they are blood money. After conferring together, they use them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this, tree, for this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet of Jeremiah. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price. And they gave them to the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Our next hymn is Christ for the World We Sing in the Red Hymnal 568.
seated. Well, as I mentioned last time, uh, some years ago I became fascinated with the bad boys and girls of the Bible, and I started digging into their stories. Last week we talked about Pontius Pilate. And this time I would like to talk about one of the more infamous characters, Judas Iscariot, the betrayer of Christ. But before we, we can really understand who Judas was, we need to take a look at who the zealots were, because Judas Iscariot was a zealot, Simon Peter was a zealot, there were probably several other zealots among uh, Christ's disciples and followers. Now the zealots were a, uh, uh, shall we say, a group of freedom fighters, depending on, on your perspective. If you were a Jew in Judea at that time, the Zealots were a group of freedom fighters. If you were a Roman or a non-Jew, the Zealots were terrorists. They would engage in theft, mayhem, murder, destruction of Roman property, uh, their goal was to frustrate and ultimately drive out the Roman occupation forces from Judea and reestablish the throne of King David. Now, though Herod did have some light claim on that throne, he really was not recognized by the zealots as being a legitimate king. They wanted a real direct descendant of David. And along comes Jesus. Jesus, on both sides of his family, mother and father, or stepfather, however you consider Joseph, was descended directly in the line of King David. And to the zealots, this was gold. This was the guy that we could put on the throne because he had the bloodline. No question about it. So the zealots who want to overthrow the Roman rule, they want to undo the puppet rulers that Rome has put into place. Okay. Jesus is their best shot, their best opportunity. They see themselves in much the same way that uh, the, the Jews viewed the Maccabees. If you're familiar with the story of Hanukkah, the founding of Hanukkah, it was the Maccabees who overthrew the Greek occupation forces from Alexander the Great. So the zealots in that vein, they, they, this was absolutely the best opportunity. So along comes Jesus, and he comes out and he starts preaching, and what does he preach? He preaches love and forgiveness. He preaches tolerance. He actually goes and heals the servants of some of the Roman occupiers. Well, if you're a zealot, you're kind of wondering, what's this guy up to? But you think about it and you say, all right, well, okay, you know what? It's early on in his work. He wants to keep a low profile, keep his head down, doesn't want to stir up too much trouble just yet while he's building up his reputation. Right? Okay, that makes sense. Sermon on the Mount comes along, Mount of Olives, and he's preaching. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the... Well, all right, all right. Nothing there about the overthrowing. Got to keep a low profile. We can, we can probably think about that. that. That makes sense. He goes into the temple and chases out the money changers. Well, the zealots love that because the, the corrupt temple, that's something that they would like to undo as well because... The high priest is a puppet appointed by the governor of Syria, the Roman governor in Syria. So we want to get rid of that anyway. So all right, there, there's a good move. That's a good move. We can, we can deal with that. See, Jesus maybe is this guy. Right? He is this military messiah that we're looking for. He's just keeping his head down for the moment. Now, then comes the incident where... The temple elder, the, the, the Sanhedrin, calls Jesus and says, Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And he says, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. All right, now we got a problem. But again, because this guy is in the throne of David, and, and, and he's our best shot, we're just going to overlook that. He's just keeping his head down, maybe, right? You know, because 
They're determined that this is what's going to happen, but the time just isn't right yet. And they make another excuse. So finally comes what we call Palm Sunday, the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Jesus rides in, and the crowds are there. They're shouting, Hosanna, which means save us. Son of David, save us. And they greet him with the palm branches, and they greet him with, with their cloaks on the road, all of these symbols of what you would provide to a victorious general returning home from war. The full expectation that Jesus is now going to call for the revolution against the Roman Empire. who are going to kick the Romans out after all. There's only about 3,000 Roman soldiers in Judea. They can't possibly stand up to 100,000 Jews all in revolt at the same time, right? So, this is the moment. And Judas, he's there. He's right in there. He's ready to go. And Judas is a pretty important guy within the, uh, the scheme of things. And remember, now, he might not have been one of the James, John, and Peter, the three, but he was the treasurer of the group, which means he's probably number four or five if there was a pecking order among the disciples. Okay? He's a pretty important guy with influence. And so, Judas is all ready for this fight. He's a good zealot. So what does Jesus do? With these th throng, throngs just calling out to him, what does he do? He orders the disciples to go prepare for the Passover meal. We're going to have supper. I just see Judas' face like, supper? Okay, well, we're good Jews. It's Passover. Or what? We gotta have a meal, so all right, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Besides, we're gonna have a nice little quiet place up in this attic in some guy's house. Good place for a planning session, strategy session too, right? Yeah, so, so they go and they have the Passover meal and nothing happens, at least not what Judas expects. Judas is expecting the call to arms and he does not get it. Jesus doesn't do what, he, what Judas expects. And Judas becomes angry. He becomes upset. And he goes out, and he sells out. He goes to the leaders of the temple and says, I will show you, Jesus, you pay me 30 pieces of silver, which is about the price of a small farm in those days. Now, what's kind of interesting is Judas, as I said, was not the only zealot in the group. Peter was a zealot. All right? We heard about another Simon, not Peter, who was a zealot. And yet, they listened to Jesus and they took on a whole new way of looking at things. They changed their hearts and their minds to see a new, bigger, broader picture. And Judas stuck to his traditional way of looking at things. He wouldn't change his mind. He wouldn't see what Jesus was really trying to tell him. He didn't get it. Maybe he refused to get it. I mean, he's a pretty smart guy, obviously, if he's the treasurer of the group. He had some education. He was... No fool, no idiot. He just refused to see. And he was disappointed as a result of things not going the way he expected. So he sells out. Now how many times do we find ourselves in a similar position? How many times do we find ourselves facing frustration, facing disappointment, we become upset, we become angry because somebody doesn't do something the way we expect. Like 
getting laid off from a job after 20 years. <laughs> and you want to lash out. You're angry. You want to let these people know that they have disappointed and frustrated you, that they have let you down. Fortunately, in my case, I stopped and thought about it, like I told Gracie before, and did not lash out emotionally as much as I wanted to, and just work through my situation. But we still find ourselves in that situation even with God. We pray for things that we want, for things we feel we may need. But the response we get from God is not the response that we expect. And it upsets us. We get angry because we don't understand. We, we have one point of view, one set of ideas as to the way things should go, but God comes over here and says, it's going to be something else. Now we can respond in one of two ways. We can lash out in anger, be angry with God, walk away from God, and from those people who disappoint us. Or we can stop and think and open our minds to a new way of looking at things that maybe God says no because there's something else that God has in mind that's better. We just haven't seen it yet. Maybe God says no because what we want is really not what we need. Maybe what we're asking for is dangerous because God can see all the possible futures that might happen to us, but we can't. We don't have that capacity. It's not a part of us. So these are times when we must learn to trust God, even though it's very hard to do because we just can't see where it's all going. We have to trust in love. We have to be patient. Because maybe something better is coming along, we just can't see it yet. Or maybe something worse could happen if we did get what we wanted down the road. We just need to be patient. Peter was. Judas wasn't. But then we see that Judas, after Jesus was turned over, even before Jesus was crucified, Judas realized his mistake. And he tried his best to undo it. He tried to atone for it within his limited power to do so. He felt great remorse. Now, what happened to Judas is of some debate because we have the gospel passage which tells us that he hung himself. We have the passage in Acts that say that he fell down in his new field and was killed. Some try to reconcile the story by saying both things happened, that he'd hung himself and then when after a while in the sun the rope broke and he fell into the field and all the mess happened. But we don't really know which of those is true. But we do know from both accounts that Judas repented of what he had done. Now last week I'd mentioned about Pontius Pilate and about the story from the, one of the African Orthodox churches where they believed that Pilate and his wife later converted to Christianity and were martyred by the Emperor Nero despite the fact that Pilate was like one of the most vile people in the face of the earth at that time. And I gotta wonder if Judas repented for what he did, did God find in his eternal loving heart, his unconditionally loving heart, the ability to forgive Judas? 
That's one question that I am going to ask Christ when I get there. Did you forgive Judas for what he did to you? The fact that I can even ask the question makes me think that it's in fact possible. That it's possible. So we take away the lesson just like we did the last time that no matter how bad a person you are, no matter what evil that you may have done to others in this world, or even to yourself, that you can be forgiven and that redemption is possible. The opportunity is there for anyone who wants it. That's really what communion is there to remind us about. We take away the lesson that we need to be patient with God and with each other because we do not, do not always understand what it is that is happening to us and why. We don't always get the answer to why, at least not right away. But if we spend time in prayer and meditation, sometimes we understand why. We may not like the answer to why. We may think that it is unjust. We may think that it is unfair. But when we understand why people do certain things that they do, particularly when it's done to us, it helps us to understand what motivates them. When we understand what motivates them, it really helps us to forgive. As Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And they didn't. How many times have people done wrong to us because they just didn't understand what it was they were doing? They didn't know. So we learn, through Judas' story, how to open ourselves to a different way of thinking, a different way of looking at God, a different way of looking at life and each other. And through that, we can find new avenues to forgive. Amen? Amen. Now our next hymn is... There we are. Come and find the quiet center, number 2128, the faith we sing.
take a few moments to share with one another the blessings that the Lord has given us this week and also the concerns that weigh on our hearts. Anyone have any joys? Yes, Tammy. <laughs> there you go. Excellent. I've never heard of psychosomatic health before. But hey, yeah. <laughs> Praise God. Anyone else? Yeah, Donna. But you're always a glowing presence to us, radiation or not, Donna. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yes. April, you had your hand up. heard about that at, at Pleasant Street also. Some of the teachers there uh, were uh, mentioning it. So, uh, oh yes, they're going through a very uh, difficult period. Mm -hmm. Chuck, you have something? Yeah, I'd like to come to the microphone to the people at home who are listening to the field where I have Sure. Uh, I have both I want the people at home to hear this also. Uh, it's about a member of our uh, congregation. I have both a concern that turned into a joy. Uh, Susan and I were doing the altar yesterday and we took one of the uh, better plants that was still in pretty good shape, looking quite joyous. And we decided to visit Peggy, 
the group and take it to her. So we drove over to her house and I went to the door and I knocked. And like what happens a lot, Peggy doesn't sometimes come to the door. So I knocked a little harder in case she couldn't hear me and still no Peggy. So I said, well, I'll take out my cell phone and I will call her number and say, Peggy, it's me. Would you please come to the door? I have a plant for you. And Peggy answered the phone. And I told her why I was there and could she come get the plant. She said, I would love to, but nobody's going to answer the door. I'm in rehab at Pleasant Valley. So we need prayers for concern, but I have to tell you, I told her, well, you sit right there, don't go away. <laughs> and I drove from her house to Ple Pleasant Valley and I went in and uh, eventually wandering around found somebody who could tell me which room was hers and uh, went and visited her. And I tell you, she was sitting up on the side of the bed looking just absolutely wonderful and said she was feeling much better, uh, that she was there because she was not feeling good at home. She called her healthcare worker and said, I need to go to the hospital, please come get me. And we all know Peggy, and that sounds very much like her, and God bless her. Mm -hmm. And so they found out she had pneumonia. So she had been in the hospital for several days, and they got her feeling better. And she is in rehab, sitting on the side of the bed, talking everybody's ear, and keeping them all quite entertained, and being very joyous, as our sign says, mm -hmm. out front. She is an amazing woman at 91, and I want everybody to know our, prayer, our prayers are always needed, and that she misses us all very much. And I told her that we miss her, and at any time, if she wanted to return to give me a call, and we'd find a way to get her here. Mm -hmm. But thanks for listening. I wanted to share what I thought was a very joyous day and story and experience. Thanks. Thank you, Chuck. That's great. Yes. I have talked with Peggy on a number of occasions, and if, it, if you haven't talked with Peggy, you really need to. The stories that she can tell are absolutely amazing. So uh, it's, uh, she has had quite the life. So yeah, if you're, if you're looking for some entertainment someday, go visit Peggy because she can tell you of adventures that most people only dream about. So <laughs> it's incredible. So do we have any other prayers, Joyce? Yes. What is it? It's uh, Gloria's birthday was Thursday, and uh, she's trying very quickly to avoid it, but <laughs> hoping it would go by quietly. But I wouldn't let her. Um, so that was uh, that. That was the big event in, in this week in, in our life. And uh, Jacob is uh, still recovering. Uh, Thursday we went down to Boston, in Boston, but they decided not to remove the drain in his abscess site just yet. Tuesday, we're gonna go back in to Nashua this time. He's got office hours in Nashua on Tuesday, so we'll go take care of it then, I think, at this point. So, uh, but he's in good spirits and doing pretty well there in that regard. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, my new job's working out okay. Thank you for your prayers and concerns on that. And um, On the prayer list was my friend Ernie, who I grew up with, and uh, uh, he had a stroke, actually multiple strokes in the, over the course of a week, but uh, he's actually recovering now. I don't know if he'll ever get use of his arm back, which is unfortunate because he's a bass player. That's what he does for a living, a musician. And so uh, it's kind of hard to play a stand-up bass when you only have one arm. So uh, prayers for him in terms of, of that, but his rehab is going well. And, uh, which is good. He's, he's in good spirits there is that way, and he's walking around again, which is, which is always a concern. Um, so, but that's, a, that's what I have on my list, as well as, well, Pastor Nori is coming back on Friday, so she should be returning Friday, so uh, travel prayers for her as well. Uh, so it would be nice to have her returning home. Yes? 
Yes, okay. Barbara's birthday is this week, yes. Happy birthday today. So yes, lots of people born in May. Yes, bigger. Didn't some players told my son in law um we were told not to have dinner because they didn't want to that story before. <laughs> Constantly chasing Gloria after, you know, like, Gloria, don't do that. You really should, you gotta rest, you can't do it. You know, like, <laughs> if I don't do it, who's going to? Well, me. Yeah, but you never do it the right way. <laughs> so, all right, well, let's go to the God in prayer. Most holy and heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful blessings that you have shared with us, the beauty of springtime, the lovely birds, the flowers. <clears throat> they always restore hope in our hearts after a long, cold winter. We thank you for the blessings and the set of our friends and the stories that they tell us. We thank you for all of those wonderful things that you have done for them, for us for our church community. We thank you for the ability to make a difference here in our town. And Lord, we lift up to you those people who are seeking new ways to worship you. We lift up to you those who, who, who have lost their houses of worship and need a new place to call home with you. We lift up those who are sick for those who have diagnoses that are still uncertain. They need your confident touch. They need to feel your love now more than ever. Be with them, help them, heal them where possible. We lift up those who are traveling. We ask for your blessing to be on them for safe journey. And we lift up to you, Lord, those who are struggling with depression, mental illness, and for those people around them who suffer alongside them. We ask that you give them confidence. We ask that you give them, you give them hope where there seems to be none. Open our hearts and our minds to new ways of understanding what's happening in the world around us, what's happening to us so that we may be more loving and more forgiving, more compassionate than we have been before. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we ask this as he taught us, he us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. turn to one another in passing the peace of Christ as we are all children of the same God.
Now let us return to God a portion of those gifts which he has so graciously shared with each of us. Heavenly Father, we offer to you these humble gifts of money and service for the growth of your kingdom. Please accept these tokens of our faithfulness. Use them to your will. We thank you for your continued blessings on us. In the name of your resurrected Son, we pray. Amen. after 14 years of doing this, I'd have it all memorized, but I don't. In the United Methodist Church, we have open communion. That means anyone who earnestly or earnestly seeks a relationship with God is welcome to participate at God's table. So let us pray together in confessing our sins before the Lord. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Filled with grace, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, led by the compassion of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven.
It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn, Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many by the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. And by your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes at his next and final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. As we are one body, we are all invited to the table of love and reconciliation. Come all you who are loved by God. Come to the table of the Lord. Come and eat and drink with no cost. Please come forward as directed by the ushers.
Let us pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 174 in the United Methodist Hymnal. His name is wonderful. We'll just sing it through one time. may the peace of God that passes all understanding be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Please be seated.